Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted and privileged to welcome a very, very accomplished entrepreneur from Poland, Portugal, currently talking to us from Dubai, Petra Miller. Pat Petra, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Petra. Petra is the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of the Jet Group. She's also the CEO of the Transcendent, Transcendent Media Capital. She's uh, an internationally advisory, international advisory board member of the World Sustainable Development Forum. She's an associate fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Science, and she's a member of a number of UN working groups. So Pera, with such an amazing kind of uh, set of things that you are doing, tell me a little bit about your own journey in brief. Yeah. So I started venture building when I was younger, when I was 24. Um, I was building companies for other people and I worked across different industry sectors, um, you know, supply chain, Mm -hmm. uh, tourism, hospitality, financial services. I found that um, the things that had me not really feel like I fit in very easily when I was younger, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had some like social anxieties and troubles when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. They were the things that I learned later actually were my differentiating power. So Mm -hmm. I had the ability to think differently and Mm -hmm. find niche market premium pricing opportunities when it came to ventures. And so Mm -hmm. I successfully built ventures for other people until I was 32. Okay. And at that time, then I was a single parent of two kids. And so uh, I took a big risk and I sold everything in Australia and quit my corporate career and then Mm -hmm. traveling with my kids. And we settled in Northern Thailand for about five years. Wow. And that was amazing. Hmm. Uh, during my experience in Australia, uh, working, building companies, I'd by accident become a mining specialist. And I don't wow. mean crypto mining, I mean actual natural mm-hmm. resource mining uh, mm-hmm. because it's quite quite a lot of that in Australia. Yeah. And I'd just seen a lot of really uh, poor strategy practices that had really big implications for real mm-hmm. societies and real people and communities and definitely the ecology And so what I knew when I left Australia, I didn't really know where I was going or what I was going to do, but I knew I I didn't want to do that Mm. anymore. And I wanted to have a positive impact in the world. Mm. So after having a couple of years to be a full-time parent, which was Mm. my only time that I gifted myself to do that uh, in Thailand, I figured out what I wanted to do next. And so I lent on my arts background and decided I wanted to work in film. Mm-hmm. And so a friend of mine had a production services company. So I got kind of a big break into a couple of Hollywood productions out of mm-hmm. Thailand. Mm-hmm. And um, during that time in the storytelling phase of my life, mm-hmm. I went undercover into northern Myanmar. Wow. Okay. Uh, behind the front lines of the Kachin, uh, the war between mm-hmm. the Burmese military junta and the, and the Kachin people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was at the time that Hillary Clinton had done big announcements about opening up uh, Myanmar and yeah. were being signed with the ethnic groups. This was back in 2012. Mm. And when I went there, I saw kids who were in refugee camps that were without parents. They wow. didn't know whether their parents were alive or dead. They had mm. been marched by their school teachers through the jungle to mm. escape um, the raising of their village. I saw footage, um, you know, of the military junta mm. not retreating after the peace treaties were signed, but just repositioning. Mm. And two days later, they bombed the capital city and broke their own peace treaty. Mm. Um, and, and and all of this devastation. Uh, and, and what I learned through that process was that it is an ethnic war in terms of there's an inherent racism and hatred from the mm-hmm. Burmese towards the ethnic groups. Right. But up the east and west coast of the country are these natural gas pipelines. Mm. And so the Burmese are systematically uh, removing people from their villages along these coasts to make way for um, larger oil and gas companies Mm. to mine these resources. And so Mm. when we look at the UN reports, a lot of um, war that is considered ethnic war and conflict that is considered ethnic conflict Mm -hmm. is linked to resources. Wow. And um, so what I also learned was that these same companies that were in part funding Mm. um, the destruction of these ethnic groups Mm -hmm. uh, were also rating quite highly on ESG indices. Mm. So I realised that at this time that storytelling alone wasn't going to be enough. Mm. 
Mm. So I moved with my kids to Europe and we set up um, a number of different companies. Uh, so I created a family office called mm -hmm. Hamel Group. Uh, family office and we invest in regenerative assets mm -hmm. so we started transcendent media capital which you mentioned which is a venture yeah. story for building startups mm -hmm. or investing in startups to have them become regenerative and then jet group was one of the first that we worked on um, which in its first iteration was it was a tech company mm -hmm. uh, but now it has repositioned and built the capabilities to deliver whole uh, regenerative transitions for whole cities mm -hmm. uh, investor portfolios and corporations and so that's really where I'm focusing my energy now mm -hmm. um, at the same time I was asked by the former chairman of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Dr. Rahendra Pachari um, who I'm sure you're familiar with mm -hmm. um, but recently passed in 2020, I was asked, he was a dear friend and he asked me to sit on his international advisory board mm -hmm. for the World Sustainable Development Forum. I also got involved in a, uh, the All Hands Group, which is a multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder group working to prevent or counter radicalization and violent extremism. Wow. So I became really aware of the intersections between climate and climate risk, our quality of life, and the conditions that give rise to radicalization and violence in our societies. Mm. So I needed to come up with a model or find a way to invest or to build in a way that was really going to move us beyond that that pattern and that those series of Amazing. dynamics. Yeah. Wow, Peter, what an incredible journey. I probably will have to do half a dozen recordings with you to with you to even try and cover a little bit of everything that you have achieved so far. But today, let's talk about uh, the JET Group and the Regenerative uh, Innovation Program. Right. For my viewers and listeners, help me understand how do you define regenerative and what are the things that you cover in this innovation program? Okay. So it's probably easier to understand regenerative uh, in relationship to three other paradigms. Mm -hmm. So the first paradigm is what we call um, value returns, which is mm -hmm. how our traditional business uh, and society works. And if you right. do an MBA, you'll probably be trained to think in terms of value returns as well. Yeah. It comes from post uh, Morgan Friedman, this idea that we have to extract as much as we can for as mm -hmm. low cost as we can, scale as fast as we can for a, and, and maximize our return to shareholders. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the primary objective of uh, an organization. Mm. Well, we've been doing that for quite some time now, and we've found that in the past 50 years, we've hit what we call the Great Anthropocene, which is a mass acceleration of global warming, mm -hmm. mass uh, extinction of uh, species across okay. the planet, mass right. desertification and all these types of things. And so we know now that that model of working, that paradigm of working mm. isn't sustainable, right? So then there's been this shift towards, um, well, how do we stop doing it that way? Mm. So then we move to the next paradigm, which is called arrest development. Um, no, arrest disorder, sorry, arresting mm -hmm. disorder. And that's where we see commitments being made like divestment into mm. oil and gas. Um, mm. We see the emergence of ESG indices and ESG investing and the talks right. of net zero. It's how mm. do we do less bad? How do we stop the bad stuff from happening? Mm. Mm. Well, we can do that, but the science shows that if we focus on only doing that, we're not actually going to mitigate our existing carbon load. Mm -hmm. We're not actually going to bring life back onto the planet that we've mm. systematically broken up. Mm. So the next paradigm is what we call doing good. And there's mm -hmm. lots of really amazing, good-hearted people on the planet seeking to do good. Right. And it's from this paradigm that we, you know, the emergence of impact investing came about mm -hmm. and, and B Corp and these types of things. Mm. So what we see is very well-meaning, good-hearted people wanting to make a difference, mm -hmm. uh, but they're thinking in terms of sectors and silos mm -hmm. and I'm going to create a venture that's going to solve the carbon credit crisis mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. I'm going to create a venture that's going to tackle agriculture mm. and these types of things. Um, so they are seeking to still get returns and, and do some good on the planet. But the challenge is that it's not systematic. Mm. It's not tapping into what are the patterns that are giving rise to mm -hmm. the breaking down of or the degeneration mm. if you want, mm. Mm. Of, our, of our systems and our societies. Yeah, Regeneration goes beyond that. And regeneration is about regenerating the conditions that give life the mm -hmm. opportunity to thrive. Okay. 
and it's nature-based design. So when we're designing or thinking, we're thinking in terms of systems in holes, mm -hmm. right? So when we look at our, a city, for instance, we look at the city as a whole. Right. We don't look at it in terms of, okay, this part of the city is about um, affordable housing, this part of the city is about infrastructure and so on and so forth. Mm. We look at it as a whole living system. And in that, what we work to, to understand is what's unique about the place. Now, mm. this can be applied to a corporation as much as a physical place, as much as an investor for portfolio that's driven by a particular investment thesis. Mm. So there are a set of assumptions and patterns that have emerged over time that give rise to certain behaviours and certain actions taking place. Mm. In order to solve the climate crisis and really address the fundamental risk to all of our assets, mm -hmm. really, into the future, we need to have a mindset shift as much as we need to have a bit of a behaviour shift. Right. Uh, and so regeneration looks at that. It looks at who am I being, the self, in relationship to the group or the community, mm -hmm. and that is nested in relationship to the world. So when we're looking at how living systems work, everything is nested. A tree is nested in a forest, which is nested in a national park, which is nested in a, a city and, and mm. so on and so forth. So oh, it's yeah. a, shift, a shift away from siloed, um, compartmentalised mm. to really working to understand how systems work. Mm. So would I be right in understanding that regenerative investing is a much larger vision and an impact investment is focused on some particular projects that could exactly. be a part of the entire regenerative uh, whole. It could be, yes. So exactly, it could be. So so that's a nice way to, to frame it, actually. Thank mm -hmm. you. So an, an example of uh, a regenerative investment is say you're investing in a hotel mm -hmm. or a piece of real estate. Right. So instead of just investing in the building, which is traditionally what happens. And traditionally mm. what happens is you'll get a bunch of designers and engineers and architects coming together, mm. putting something on paper, and then going and trying to get approvals for that process, getting mm. feedback. But it's a very kind of colonial way of doing it. It's like, mm. I know what needs to go here. I know what's best. Mm. Here's what it is. And then there starts a process of negotiation mm. and compromise in that process. You know, mm. some folks don't like this. Some folks don't like that. Mm. And eventually you compromise enough so you can get common ground mm. but in that process of compromise everyone gives up stuff that's important to them mm. right mm. so when we're investing in say in a hotel or a real estate project that is regenerative we see the new emergence of these concepts of place making mm. so it's where the asset itself is nested within a community or mm. a place or a region mm. and before you even put pen to paper for the designs you start working with the community mm. And you start looking at how what's important to the community, what's important to the place. And it's mm. a full integration of soci sociological, ecological and economic factors. Mm. Mm. And so there's a beautiful example of one that's being done in Mexico called mm. Playa Viva, mm. where instead of, you know, getting the government to, you know, build a highway directly to the, the, the resort, which was offered by the government, they said, mm. no, we want to work with the community and it was kind of a degenerating community, ecologically mm -hmm. speaking, but socially it had this traditional example of young people leaving this town to go and live in the big city because this mm -hmm. is where the jobs were and, and these types of things. They started co-designing mm -hmm. and very, very powerfully built new industry for the community at the same time. Mm -hmm. They restored a lot of the um, ecology that had started to degenerate. They built new agricultural practices. Mm -hmm. And all of this came through the resort. Mm. So what happened with the resort was it was thriving. It got the unanimous yes vote on the build like ahead mm. of schedule, mm. came in under time and under budget mm. and continued to be profitable through, even during the COVID pandemic, which mm. was really unusual for that, that particular sector. Mm. Um, but in addition, one of the biggest outcomes for the community was that young mm -hmm. people stopped leaving. They yeah. actually started coming back to the town because there was new opportunity and really great expression of that, what we call essence of plays coming mm. up through the, re the rest of the town. Mm. Very interesting. And, that, and the way in which they, you know, built their roots to the hotel came through the actual town. Mm. So that anybody who was visiting the place to get to the hotel to stay mm. there had to engage with the town and the community on their way through, which obviously bolstered their economic mm. viability. Mm. So when you look at a regenerative investment project, what is the kind of support that you need from the society and from government? 
Well, you don't really need support. You need participation. Okay. Uh, because regeneration is a developmental process. As I said, it's, it's a little bit of a mindset shift because it has us thinking differently. When we go to school, we're taught to understand problems by breaking them up into parts and pieces. Mm -hmm. It's a very engineering mindset. Mm. Um, and it's very me mechanistic, come from you know post-industrialization. And that and that worked for a bit. It got us, it's got us really efficient, mm -hmm. but it didn't make us very effective in terms right. of impacts across mm. the whole system. Mm. And so what we do is when we are working, we demand to work with the government as participants, mm. uh, civil society as participants, um, businesses and local uh, interest groups as participants. Mm. Um, one area that we're we'll be, uh, proceeding to work in the not too distant future in the Middle East is a very tribal area where mm. the government hasn't touched that city in 50 years because of the complexity of the tribes. Mm. So we'll be bringing the tribes in to participate in the process. Mm. Um, so what it really requires is a participation and a willingness to learn and grow and see mm. something different, right? Mm. And that everybody's vested in that process. And what happens is so phenomenal mm. that people come up with what we call like a collective vocation, a shared mm. sense of purpose, something that they're working towards that they all identify with. Right. Um, and, th and that's how these value multiples accelerate and mm. are achieved over time. Mm. And you mentioned that uh, a large amount of the money comes from a family office for these uh, regenerative investments. Um, well, only our family office is focusing in on that. And what we do is we grow uh, the, the assets to, uh, we make sure that they're regenerative first. Mm. We make sure that they're revenue generating. We grow them to series A mm. and then we open them up to co-investment for other family offices. Mm. But in a general uh, regenerative transition project, like for a city, for instance, the government will fund um, the first year, which is the... Um, the process of the community engagement mm, and mm. the understanding of the patterns and the place potential. Mm. Um, there's this beautiful saying that says nature doesn't have problems, it only has potential. Mm. Yeah, we, we think in terms of problems and solutions rather than how do we unlock potential for individuals, mm. individual development as well as place development. Um, and so regenerative focuses on potential, not problems. And so then uh, what happens after that year one is the community starts innovating, new technologies mm, get developed, mm, new mm. Um, initiatives emerge and new industries. And so effectively what arises out of that first year of working with a city, mm. the diversified portfolio opportunity right. of infrastructure investments, building investments, digital assets, mm. um, private equity in opportunities, a whole range, natural capital investments, mm. And so then that's when we, uh, you know, go out to funds and go out to other investors to see how they want to uh, actually bring money into mm. something that's already been regeneratively designed. Very interesting. And better, a lot of these investments could be of a reasonably long duration um, because they seem to be, you know, government supported, maybe infrastructure. How does uh, a family office uh, get a return and how long uh, do you stay invested? Uh, well, the returns are actually pretty fast. Okay. Yeah. So most countries have made their net zero pledges to 2050. Okay. Right? We can get cities beyond that in six to eight years. Mm. Because the way of working when you're working regeneratively accelerates everything. Mm. You don't get tied up in bureaucracy. You don't get tied up in legal. You don't mm. get tied up in all of these things that are heavily costly. Mm. Your time to market is so much faster, mm. right? And everybody's participated in the kind of evolutionary business model design. So there was a colleague of mine worked on a wastewater treatment plant plan in um, British Columbia, mm. Vancouver. Yeah. And uh, they came in under time, under budget, had the first unanimous yes vote for a build in the history of the region. Mm -hmm. And they actually did uh, more significantly more uh, revenue streams through that project mm -hmm. that were designed by the community, actually, mm -hmm. um, than were forecasted by the big four that did the net present value calculation on the asset. Mm -hmm. So ultimately... Um, you know, the, the, the community became stewards of that asset. It became a center pin to the rest of the community. Mm. They even invented new technologies of how to treat waste mm. as a means to regenerating the ecology on the estuary where it was located. 
So, so the returns are pretty fast, mm. actually. Mm-hmm. Fast. When you think about VCs, they invest in a way where they expect 95% of their assets to fail mm. and that 5% will be unicorns. They hope and that that's where they mm. make their money. Mm. So we do it differently. We take more time up front. We invest regeneratively, but we find that virtually every opportunity succeeds and delivers returns within the first year or two. Very interesting. And uh, as a family office or a, or a, a number of family offices who you may pull in, what is the kind of support you give to uh, the, the the founder? Yeah. Well, well, so we're supporting it in two ways. There's the founders of the family offices um, and, and normally the investment decisions often aren't made by the founders anyway. Mm. A lot of family offices pull in like asset managers like from Goldman yep. Sachs, these mm-hmm. guys who mm-hmm. don't really understand impact investing, Correct. let alone regenerative investing. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of an education process. So that's why our family office has set up an education arm to work with other families to mm-hmm. help them understand what does regenerative investing mean? How does it look? What do the assets look like? What's the process? Mm-hmm. Um, and then in terms of the startups that we invest in, we work very closely with the founders of those startups. Mm-hmm. We have a, a BDC, a business development corporation within our family office where we go out Sometimes we'll take a management role. Like at the moment, you can see that I'm sitting as the CEO of Jet Group. Mm. Um, This has been my focus to really build that company out in a powerful way, make it really regenerative. And doing the whole city scale Mm. investment has required leveraging my networks. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for me to do that. Um, And and so, you know, my brother has a background in life sciences um, and technology. And so, you know, we're just kind of like moving around our different assets, supporting Mm. And sometimes we don't need to physically be in there, but we've created what we call an extended talent network where we'll train different talent from around the world in in regenerative practice, really, with a view to stepping into a role in one of our companies Mm. to help build out those capabilities. Fascinating. And my last question, Jupiter, and this is for the many, many people who will listen to our conversation. Based on your incredible journey, which has taken you from Australia to Thailand to northern Myanmar to Portugal to the UAE and God knows how many other countries. Many other countries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away from your amazing journey um, and from our conversation? Yeah. Um, I would say firstly, work to find out what your unique difference is. Okay. Whatever that is for you, whatever that unique expression for you is, yeah. be proud of it. It has enormous value. It's okay. your gift to contribute to the world. You do not have to emulate, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs or the, you know, the um, any any folks that you think are okay. the Elon Musks or whatever that yeah. are worth modelling. Find your own spot and mm. stand in it. Mm. The second thing that I would suggest is don't take even including what I've said today, don't take anything that people say as gospel. Develop your critical thinking skills. Yeah. The world needs innovators. And it means that we need to stand outside of the paradigms and the frameworks with which we've been taught in our schools, by our families, by our, you know, societies to really think about things differently. Yeah. And the, and the third one is connect back to nature. Mm. We have lost, we've systematically killed off 95% of our Indigenous folks around the world. Mm. 5% of the planet's population are Indigenous and they care for 85% of the planet's biodiversity. Mm. There is so much for us to learn from them and from nature that kind of we lost through our industrialised thinking. Mm. And if we can return back to understanding how complexity works, will be able to create enormous value. Amazing. Amazing. And on that note, and your three amazing lessons, work to find out your own unique difference. Don't emulate or copy anyone. Don't take anything as gospel. Think for yourself. And the third one, connect to nature. Thank you so much, Pera, for speaking to me about your own journey, which is so incredible. And I must set up a separate conversation with you on your going undercover to Myanmar. That's so fascinating. Thank you also for talking to me about uh, 
regenerative investment about the transcendent uh, transcendent media capital and uh, on all the other wonderful things that you're doing thank you for speaking to me and good luck thank you so much ashutosh thank you for listening to the brand called you video cast and podcast a platform that brings you knowledge experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals you can also follow us on youtube facebook instagram and twitter just search for the brand called you